the uh, debt limit, raising the debt limit. That meeting happens this afternoon at 4 Eastern. We'll have cameras there just in case we hear comments from members following that, uh, that meeting with Secretary Geithner. And now we're going to take you live to the House floor here on C-SPAN. The House will be in order. The prayer will be offered today by our guest chaplain, Reverend John Sloop, First Presbyterian Church, Harrisonburg, Virginia. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come in prayer knowing that you love us and are very much concerned about what goes on in this chamber today as these members seek to be good stewards of the trust placed in them by we, the people. We confess our human frailty and pray to be delivered from taking up today's agenda out of pure self-interest or peer pressure, but rather lead us, Lord, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Father, grant each member wisdom in their thinking on the issues, courage in their convictions, and above all, grace in their attitudes toward one another. And when this day is done, may each one hear the Master say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Now, Father, with deep respect for the faith traditions of all members, I offer this prayer in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The chair has examined, examined uh, the journal of the last day's proceedings and announces to the House his approval thereof, and pursuant to Clause 1 of Rule 1, the journal stands approved. Uh, the Pledge of Allegiance today will be led by the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Poe. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. objection of the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Goodlatt, will be recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to introduce and welcome the Reverend Dr. John Sloop, Senior Pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Harrisonburg, Virginia, a church that has grown to over 1,100 members and over 500 attendees for Sunday services. Dr. Sloop has served the First Presbyterian Church and the Harrisonburg community since he received his calling in 1986. Dr. Sloop is passionate about seeing the Presbyterian Church renewed and growing again, and he has been actively involved in Presbyterian for Renewal, the Presbyterian Coalition, the Confessing Church Movement, and has served on the board of the Presbyterian Outreach Foundation. Dr. Sloop and his wife of 41 years, Gwen, are the proud parents of three children and two sons-in-law and have been blessed by five grandchildren. We welcome Dr. Sloop's family and other guests who join us today. And I'm honored to call Dr. Sloop a constituent and a friend, and I offer the thanks of this entire body today for his delivering the opening prayer. Gentlemen, yields back. Uh, the, chair, the chair will uh, entertain up to 15 um, requests for one-minute speeches on each side of the aisle. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Request permission to address the House for one minute. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, while Washington lives on in ignorant bliss regarding immigration, the American border remains wide open for the good, the bad, and the ugly. Often outlaws that enter our country illegally are criminals with no respect for the law of any nation. This past Sunday, hours before the crack of dawn, twice deported illegal Joanne Rodriguez drove through a police barricade, ran over and killed Houston police officer Kevin Will while he was working an accident scene. Rodriguez's immigration status was far from the only crime he committed that day. 
Rodriguez, a member, a purported member of the MS-13 gang, was driving three times the legal limit drunk, charged with driving while intoxicated, possession of cocaine, evading arrest, and manslaughter. The crime was so violent that Officer Willis's body was dragged down the road before the killer stopped and was apprehended. Deportation is no deterrent to criminals like Rodriguez, because as long as our border remains wide open in both directions, criminals will simply return to the United States and kill Americans. Meanwhile, Officer Will will be buried today, and that's just the way it is. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose, gentleman from Massachusetts, rise? The gentleman's recognized. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to their idea of eliminating Medicare as we know it, the Republicans are holding a bad hand. But instead of folding like a smart card player would, they have decided to go all in. Yesterday, the Republican majority voted to deem their radical Medi Medicare plan as passed into law, despite the fact that the overwhelming majority of Americans oppose them. At a time when big oil is making record profits and gouging consumers at the pump, the Republican majority has voted to balance the budget on the backs of the most vulnerable people in America, our children, our seniors, our students, and our disabled. At a time when millions of Americans are struggling to just get by, the Republican majority has voted to provide massive tax cuts for the very rich. It's not fair and it's not right. The American people are paying attention, Mr. Speaker. They are making their voices heard, including at the ballot box. I urge my Republican colleagues to listen and to abandon their reckless policies. Leave Medicare alone. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Uh, for what purpose does the gentleman lady from Washington rise? Request permission to address the House for one minute and revise the chamber. Without objection, the lady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today, just days after Memorial Day, to pay tribute to a brave man from Medical Lake, Washington, who lost his life defending our country. 37-year-old Sergeant First Class Cliff Beatty was killed in Baghdad on May 22nd when he was attacked by an improvised explosive device. He died supporting Operation New Dawn in Iraq. He died protecting our country. He died fighting for a better, freer, safer America. While we mourn the loss of this American patriot, I rise today to remind everyone that his memory will never be forgotten. We shall remember his legacy, his love, and patriotism today and every day. Sergeant First Class Beatty leaves behind his parents, his wife Karen, who is also in the Army, his 17-year-old daughter and 13-year-old son who loved their father deeply. But he also leaves behind something that is more intangible, intangible a legacy of honor for the bravery he displayed and the life he gave in the name of America. May God bless Sergeant Beatty's family and all of our brave men and women who have answered America's call to freedom. Thank you. Gentleman, ladies, time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Illinois rise? Without objection, gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to commend the work of Chicago House an organization in my district that provides housing support services and job training to people affected by HIV AIDS. I commend Chicago House not just for saving the lives of thousands of Chicagoans and pulling them out of poverty, but also for saving money. Chicago House is a perfect example of the type of program we should be investing in. Yes, we have to make a small investment up front, but programs like Chicago House take these funds and use them to train the jobless and provide employment rather than simply giving them a handout. Training individuals and securing employment for them is a double win because not only do they no longer need subsidies, but they are also contributing to the tax base. We have to make a distinction between spending and investing. Yes, we have to cut spending, but we must be careful to maintain our investments in programs like Chicago House that save lives and dollars. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to join fellow Texans and Americans all across this great country in mourning the loss of a true conservative icon, former Texas Governor Bill Clements. As those of us who were touched by the governor join together today to celebrate his life and in his honor, May we all reflect on his many achievements and generosity as a dedicated entrepreneur, 
philanthropist, and public servant for the great state of Texas. Governor Clements was the first Republican to serve as Texas governor since Reconstruction when he took office in 1979. His skillful leadership attracted Texans to the Republican Party and to modern-day conservatism, paving the way for large Republican gains across my state in the following years. Governor Clements also laid the groundwork for Texas' economic viability by recruiting business and international trade to diversify our state's economy. I'm deeply saddened by the passing of Governor Bill Clements. However, his life is being celebrated today. My thoughts and prayers are with his wife, Rita, and all of his family and friends as they celebrate his life's accomplishments and mourn this great loss, not only to America, but to the great state of Texas. God bless Texas. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey rise? Uh, without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, the Republican leadership has ignored the need for a strong jobs agenda. And worse, they have pushed budget plans that would only further depress the economy and harm the unemployed. My constituents need real job agenda in Washington now. Yet my Republican colleagues continue to promote efforts to do the opposite. On May 11th, the Committee on Ways and Means approved a Republican bill that would, unemployment, uh, would end unemployment as we know it, deceivingly calling it the JOBS Act. This act would eliminate the guarantee of federal payment for temporary extended unemployment benefits on July the 6th. This plan would take $32 billion now in the Federal Unemployment Trust Fund intended for extended unemployment benefits and ship the money to the states in block grants. It would also set unreasonable qualifying requirements to receive benefits and allow the permanent division of diversion of regular unemployment funds with waivers. More than 4 million Americans can lose extended benefits under this plan. This is unacceptable. And I assume that the floor vote on this was postponed because my colleagues on the other side of the aisle received a message of disapproval from the American people, but more than abandoning this misguided bill, we need to, a stronger effort to increase jobs and improve our economy. The American taxpayers want and deserve more now. Yield back. Jim's time has expired. For what purposes does the gentleman from California rise? Without objections, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. We'll soon vote on an amendment I offered last night. It simply says that none of the funds in this appropriations bill can be used in contravention of the War Powers Resolution, which is the law of the land, Public Law 93-148. The law of the land states that the President can deploy troops, but then must seek congressional authorization and must withdraw within 60 days if he doesn't get it. The, uh, why do we need a, to add to this bill a provision that says the president can't spend money in violation of existing law? Because the president has asserted that resolutions of the United Nations or discussions with members of Congress substitute for congressional authorization. Why are we voting on this now? It has been ruled by the parliamentarian to be germane. We are voting now rather because Congress should take a stand before we take our one-week break. Even if you agree with everything that is happening in Libya, and we all long for democracy and the rule of law of Lib in Libya, this is a vote about democracy and the rule of law in the United States. This is our chance to simply say the President, even the President, must follow the law. Please join with me in this time to govern in supporting the Sherman Amendment. For what purpose does the gentleman from New York rise? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. The Homeland Security Appropriations Bill, which will be on the floor in just a few minutes, is a bad bill for America and a especially bad bill for New York. For it cuts funding from New York substantially. Almost 10 years after the attack on New York, we tracked down and killed Osama bin Laden. But the threat to the city of New York has not dissipated. 
New York is a prime target for terrorists because of what it symbolizes, a vibrant economic atmosphere where entrepreneurs can flourish in a land of opportunity and freedom that serves as the gateway for the poor and the huddled masses. Unfortunately, this bill takes a hacksaw to the city's counterterrorism and security efforts. According to Mayor Bloomberg, this bill would jeopardize the, continuing, the continuity and operations of counterterrorism programs in New York City that New York City has underway. Cutting more than $100 million from Homeland Security funding for New York is not only nonsensical, it is dangerous. As my friend Peter King has said, this bill puts New York at risk. These cuts place an unconscionable burden on New York, and I will therefore vote against the bill in a few minutes. And I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Kansas rise? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to discuss yet another negative impact the Dodd-Frank Act is having on the U.S. economy and job growth. As agencies here in the United States are scrambling to meet the unrealistic deadlines proposed by this act, and as community banks struggle under a mountain of new regulations that strangle our economic recovery, we have also done great damage to the competitiveness of the United States in the international financial marketplace. Other nations have yet to even consider the stringent regulations similar to the ones proposed in Dodd-Frank. Most importantly are the new proposed regulations that will require over-the-counter derivatives to be traded and cleared on exchanges. G20 nations have stated a goal for the end of 2012 as the implementation date of any global derivative reforms. Our earlier upcoming deadline of July 16, 2011 for U.S. implementation of the derivatives reforms puts the U.S. financial market at a significant global disadvantage and will further disrupt our economy, economic recovery and job growth. Let's repeal these damaging economic provisions and let's get America back to work again. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Ohio, the gentleman lady from Ohio, rise? Without objection, the gentleman lady is recognized for one minute. Thank you. I rise today because I am deeply concerned about my community's ability to address its emergency response needs. FEMA safer grants are designed to assist cities with maintaining first responders on the street. The challenge is that FEMA has a stipulation that cities cannot have employees in layoff status. The cities that are most in need of these funds are financially challenged. It is difficult for them to avoid laying off employees when they have no funds in the budget to retain them as required by the FEMA grants. This is the situation that people in my community are being confronted with. The City of Cleveland applied for and received two grants from FEMA. Due to state level budget cuts, Cleveland needs these FEMA grants now more than ever. FEMA should be granted the authority to waive the no layoff clause. This way, the funding system would be better able to live up to the intent of the grant, and our streets and communities would be safer. I yield back. General Lady yields back. For what purpose does the General Lady from Maryland rise? General Lady is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I rise in support of Medicare. It's a decades old promise that my grandmother made to my mother and that I make to my son. Um, for the last five months, Republicans have played political theater with our nation's most pressing issues, putting tax breaks for millionaires and oil companies ahead of the health care of our seniors. And just yesterday, in procedural silliness, there was yet another act by the Republican majority's quest to end Medicare and jeopardize the health of our seniors. And yet again, Republicans told our seniors loudly and clearly that they are willing, by any means necessary, to end Medicare, and that's just wrong. They've also tried to trick our seniors into believing that their budget plan wouldn't affect them today, but that's wrong too. The fact is the end of Medicare would mean that our seniors and individuals with disabilities would pay $12,500 in health care costs. The plan would force seniors to pay nearly $6,800 out of their own pockets in the first year alone. And so I'm going to urge all of us and our colleagues on the other side to stop the political theater uh, to stand with the American people, to stop their quest to end Medicare and support our seniors. How about creating jobs instead of General ending Medicare? Expired. For what purposes, a gentleman from Vermont rise? The gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this Congress and this country face two great fiscal challenges. One is long term and one is urgent and immediate. Long term, we know we have to restore balance to our budget, and negotiations are underway in an effort to accomplish that. There are significant differences in approach. Do you follow 
the outlines of the Ryan budget, which basically cut taxes for very wealthy Americans in the hope that will create jobs and pay for that by slashing or ending Medicare? Or do you proceed along the outline of the Obama budget, uh, which essentially would put everything on the table, including the Pentagon, including revenues? But either way, the urgent and immediate responsibility is that we pay our bills. In either side that engages in a game of chicken with the obligation of this country to maintain its full faith and credit is playing with fiscal fire and using a loaded gun for a game of Russian roulette. That gun is pointed at the heart of the American economy. America pays its bills. We must do that and do whatever is required in order to maintain our reputation for doing so. I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Texas rise? The gentlelady is recognized for one minute. I thank the speaker very much. Good morning. Mr. Speaker, I rise to join with my colleagues of the Congressional Progressive Caucus to ask the President to appoint a presidential appointee to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which is law. It is to protect the American people. That nominee so far has been Professor Elizabeth Warren, who has acted as an advisor. The CFPB has earned praise from the banking community for working to simplify and improve mortgage disclosure forms. This Consumer Protection Board will protect the American people from predatory lending, from foreclosures, from excessive uh, rates on your credit card. But yet, Republicans in the Senate and the other body uh, want to make ridiculous accusations to hold uh, the hostage uh, position and take this individual into a hostage position uh, and to suggest that uh, she could not counsel with a state attorney general to help that state attorney general fight against mortgage foreclosures. When have you forbidden a federal representative, a federal uh, representative of the United States government from talking to the states to be helpful? What is the purpose of the federal government other than to be helpful? It is time to stop the charades and stand with the American people, get someone working on that consumer board to protect the American people from expired. reckless and unfair mortgage practices. I yield back. General time has expired. For what purposes does the gentlelady from South Dakota rise? I wish to make a one minute, please, Mr. The gentlelady is recognized for one Thank minute. You. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to emphasize and to stand with those in my home state of South Dakota who are experiencing flooding along the Missouri River. Up and down the Missouri River, people continue to hope for the best and to prepare for the worst as floodwaters continue to rise and are going to rise to record levels over the coming days and weeks. I was in our state capital of Pier and in the Fort Pier area this past weekend with residents helping sandbag with my family and surveying the looming damage. While the forecasts for flooding grow grim, neighbors continue to help neighbors and an unshakable sense of community remains strong. I also commend the hard work of the South Dakota National Guard for swiftly responding to the call of those that are in need. Many of those affected have worked tirelessly over the past week on short notice to protect their homes. Even so, thousands could be displaced for months until the water recedes, not knowing if they'll even have a home they can go back to. Mr. Speaker, I would ask that our thoughts and that our prayers would be with all of those who have been affected by these floodings and national disasters in South Dakota and across our great country. Thank you. General Lady yields back. Pursuant to House Resolution 287 and Rule 18, the Chair declares the House and the Committee of the Whole House and the State of the Union for the further consideration of H.R. 2017. Will the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Westmoreland, kindly resume the chair? <clears throat> the House is in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for the further consideration of H.R. 2017 which the clerk will report by title. A bill making appropriations for the Department of Homeland Security for the fiscal year ending September 30, 2012, and for other purposes. When the Committee of the Whole House rose on Thursday, June 2, 2011, a request for a recorded vote on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Rakita, had been postponed and the bill had been read through page 92, line 7. 
Who seeks recognition? What? What purpose do you rise? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Ms. Baldwin of Wisconsin at the end of the bill before the short title insert the following section. None of the funds made available by this act may be used to design, develop, or procure any vessel of the Coast Guard offshore patrol cutter. Much from Alabama rise. Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order that the uh, gentlelady's uh, amendment is not in order. Point of order is reserved. Clerk will read. None of the funds made available by this act may be used to design, develop, or procure any vessel of the Coast Guard offshore patrol cutter class of ships unless the main propulsion diesel engines of the vessel are manufactured in the United States by a domestically operated entity except that the Secretary of Homeland Security may waive the application of this section if only one domestically operated entity exists to design, develop, or procure the main propulsion diesel engines. Gentlemen, the lady is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My amendment is simple. It would prohibit funds from being used to design, develop, or procure Coast Guard offshore patrol cutters unless the main diesel engines are manufactured in the United States and made by American workers. To address any concerns that this could be a single source contract, this provision may be waived to ensure competition and best value to the American taxpayer. The Coast Guard plans to build and procure 25 or more offshore patrol cutters in the coming years. And I fully support this acquisition. However, I believe that the Coast Guard should be required to purchase engines manufactured in the United States made by American workers. For some reason, though, the Coast Guard has a history of buying ship engines from foreign manufacturers. We also know that the Coast Guard has a history of designing ship platforms which give preference to overseas manufacturers, resulting in major contracts going to foreign manufacturers. This practice is driving American manufacturers out of business. Although Congress required that vessels for the Coast Guard be manufactured in the United States starting back in 1993, in recent years, the Coast Guard has continued to procure vessel engines from foreign manufacturers. Mr. Chairman, this is just plain wrong. The offshore patrol cutter is a 25-ship class, one of the Coast Guard's largest cutter classes. Making these ships here in America would generate a lot of U.S. manufacturing jobs for many years to come. But absent some direction from this Congress, I believe that the Coast Guard will continue to send American manufacturing jobs overseas. With unemployment at 9 percent, Mr. Chairman, we can no longer tolerate this situation. Let's bring these jobs back home. Let U.S. manufacturers compete for taxpayer dollars. I want to offer at least one specific example of the Coast Guard's current short-sighted procurement policy. The contract that they gave to MTU, a German manufacturer, for the main propulsion diesel engine of the first national security cutter. This vessel, the U.S. CGC Berthalf, suffered a catastrophic failure, including an explosion and destruct destruction of the piston and connecting rod that had to be replaced. Now, in its solicitation for this replacement, the Coast Guard noted, and I quote, a number of the critical parts are only currently available from the MTU factory in Germany, where these engines are manufactured. These critical parts must be specifically manufactured and have a lead time of six to eight weeks from receipt of order. In addition, these parts must pass through U.S. Customs, which may entail additional delays." End quote. The Coast Guard purchased these repairs on a sole source basis. From, a Ger from Germany at an estimated cost to the taxpayer of $265,000. U.S. manufacturers never had the chance to compete for these engines and any repair work necessary down the road. Um, again, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chairman, 
This is just plain wrong. Getting Americans back to work is my number one priority, and I believe my colleagues would agree with me on this. I know full well these are challenging economic times in my home state of Wisconsin and across the nation. Recently, I visited a manufacturing plant located in my district. Workers there are confused. They don't understand why any branch of the federal government, no less a branch of Homeland Defense, would choose to give a major contract to a foreign competitor. The workers I spoke with share the worries of working families across the country. Will they be able to support their families? Will their children have the same opportunities that they had? Or will they see their jobs shipped overseas? At the end of the day, this is about doing right by our fellow Americans. Mr. Chairman, isn't keeping capable, hardworking Americans working the essence of homeland security? In matters of national security in particular, I believe that we should ensure that American workers build what we need to keep America safe. My amendment is a small but very needed change to the current Coast Guard procurement process. It will strengthen the U.S. diesel engine manufacturing base and create many well-paying American jobs. Mr. Chairman and my fellow colleagues, we have a choice. We can continue funneling good-paid jobs overseas, or we can allow my amendment to move forward, putting the best interests of America's working families and our national security first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my remaining time. General Lay's time has expired. For what purpose did Jim from Alabama rise? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I insist on the point of order. G state your point of order. Uh, make a point of order against the amendment because it proposes to change existing law and can, constitutes legislation and an appropriation bill and therefore violates Clause 2 of Rule 21. The rule states in pertinent part, an amendment to a general appropriation bill shall not be in order if change in existing law modifies existing powers and duties. I ask for a ruling from the Chair. Does, does any member wish to be heard on the point of order? The Chair finds that uh, this amendment includes language requiring a new determination. The amendment, therefore, constitutes legislation in violation of Clause 2 of Rule 21. The point of order is sustained and the amendment is not in order. Seeks recognition. Purpose does the gentlewoman from California rise? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, uh, would the gentlelady specify the amendment, please? Uh, it is amendment number 19. Would the clerk read the amendment? Amendment number 19, printed in the congressional record, offered by Ms. Speer of California. Mr. Chair. First, the gentleman from Alabama rise. I reserve a point of order on the gentlelady's amendment. Point of order is uh, received, and the lady is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, thank you. You know, we've all witnessed a absolute uh, employment disaster in this country. Uh, last month, we found that manufacturing sector slowed again. In fact, the number of Americans involved in producing goods is near its lowest point since World War II. Meanwhile, we have some things we can do to change that. And I've got a great example to share with you today. This is a TSA uniform. This uniform is manufactured in Mexico. Imagine that. Manufactured in Mexico. A company in the United States, VF Imageware, got a contract last February in 2010 for $98 million. It promptly outsourced the sewing of this uniform to Mexico. So how many jobs were lost in this particular undertaking? It's estimated that 465 jobs for Americans was lost because this contract was outsourced to Mexico. Uh, this amendment is really quite simple. It basically will demand that the Transportation Security Administration uh, purchase clothing manufactured here in the United States. Uh, it is there for our economic security. It's also important for our national security. This, Mr. Speaker, is a nonpartisan issue. Uh, it's pretty darn simple, and I urge my colleagues to support it. 
I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. Of what purpose, gentleman from Alabama, rise? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I insist on point of order. Uh, state your point of order. I make a point of order against the amendment because it proposes to change existing law and constitutes legislation on an appropriation bill and therefore violates Clause 2 of Rule 21. The rule states in pertinent part an amendment to a general appropriation bill shall not be in order if a change in existing law requires a new determination. I would ask the ruling from the chair. Uh, does anyone uh, wish to speak on the point of order? The chair will rule. The chair finds that this amendment includes language requiring a new determination. The amendment therefore constitutes legislation in violation of Clause 2 of Rule 21. The point of order is sustained and the amendment is not in order. Recognition. Yes, Mr. Speaker, number, 19, number 18. Oh. Will that make the amendment? Amendment number 18, printed in the congressional record, offered by Ms. Spear of California. A uh, gentleman from Alabama. I reserve a point of order on the gentlelady's amendment. Point of order is reserved. Uh, the gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, in 1949, over disputes on land grants, the Congress decided to create what are called Alaska Native Corporations. There are some 200 of them that exist today. And when they started out, um, they received uh, monies that were uh, small in nature, but nonetheless helpful. Over the course of, of decades, um, what has happened here is a, an abuse by our federal employees by using this particular um, technique of contracting with the Alaska Native Corporation in order not to competitively bid contracts. They are sole source contracts. So as a result, um, by not competitively bidding these contracts, the taxpayers are the big losers. And let me give you just one example. There was a contract let to the Alaska Native subsidiary that shared the lead on a $1.1 billion contract to manage missile and weapons research in Huntsville, Alabama. Two other inexperienced subsidiaries received contracts without competition worth nearly a billion dollars to provide guards to Army bases. Now, this is pretty simple, colleagues. A billion dollar contract, you run it through the ANC, uh, the result is that you don't have to competitively bid it, and uh, what happened here is it was, the work was passed on to Wackenhut, and they overpaid by 25% on the contract compared with deals for the same work awarded through competitive bids, auditors uh, later found. So here's a billion dollar contract, you run it through the ANC, you spend 25% more of taxpayer dollars. This is real money. We're talking $250 million overspent because the ANC was used. Now you may say, but at least it's going to Alaska Natives. Well, my friends, it's not going to Alaska Natives. What happens for the most part is the Alaska Native shareholders receive about $305 per year as a result. Now let's look at just one contract for the Sitnasuk. It was a contract for $220 million. There was $14 million worth of profits. Each of the shareholders received $305. But guess what? The people that, raised, that received most of the money were the non-natives that were hired. In fact, the consulting firm based in the Bethesda home of James Nunez, a non-native hired to help run the corporation, he received a tidy sum of $6.4 million last year. His CFO, $1 million. His executive vice president, $470,000. And his COO, $430,000. So that's where the money went. My amendment would level the playing field and essentially treat all Section 8A businesses the same. My amendment would prohibit the use of funds in this act to be used to award non-competitively bid contracts to ANCs, Indian tribes or Native Hawaiian organizations in an amount in excess of the competitive bidding threshold uh, that other Section 8 participants are subject to, and that is a $6.5 million manufacturing contract. If it's under 6.5, you don't have to competitively bid. If it's over 6.5, you would have to. 
Again, members, this is an affront to the American taxpayers. I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to support this amendment, and I yield back. General lady yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Alabama rise? Sits on a point of order. The gentleman stays the point of order. Uh, I make a point of order against the amendment because it proposes to change existing law and constitutes legislation on an appropriation bill and therefore violates Clause 2 of Rule 21. The rule states in pertinent part an amendment to a general appropriation bill shall not be in order if changing existing law requires a new determination. I request a ruling from the chair. Does any other member have a, a discussion on the point of order? The chair is prepared to rule. The chair finds that this amendment includes language requiring a new determination. The amendment, therefore, constitutes legislation in violation of Clause 2 of Rule 21. The point of order is sustained, and the amendment is not in order. Who seeks recognition? For what purpose does the gentlelady from Texas rise? Could you identify the amendment? Clerk will read. Amendment offered by Ms. Jackson Lee of Texas. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following section. None of the funds made available by this act shall be used in contravention of Section 44917 of Title 49, United States Code. The gentlewoman from Texas is recognized for five minutes to speak to her amendment. I thank the uh, chairman and I thank uh, the chairman of the committee and the ranking member. This is a, a very uh, challenging process that we're going through. Um, it is challenging because we uh, are addressing uh, homeland security in the backdrop of the crisis in Libya of the Arab Spring, of the demise and end of Osama bin Laden by the brilliance of the Navy SEALs, the intelligence community, President Obama, and of course in the backdrop of domestic disasters uh, from Texas fires to tornadoes from the New England to Alabama to Missouri. But there's something that we can do. And we can recognize that there was no appointment made for 9-11. No notice was given to us on 9-11. There were indicators, individuals learning to fly or take off and not landing. And so post 9-11, we came up with the enhanced concept of ensuring uh, that we had federal air marshals, and I'm glad for that. But I think it is important now in the neighborhood that we're living in, the climate that we're living in, and the interest of terrorists, lone wolves, franchise terrorists, to attack our mobility or transit systems, which include aviation, for us to focus on ensuring that there is no undermining of the utilization strategically of air marshals to protect the American public. I can just cite, Mr. Chairman, the incidences that occurred uh, in the backdrop of Libya. Uh, individuals domestically charging the pilot door. Uh, passengers having to bring down disturbed individuals. The air skyways, if you will, are both exciting and potentially troubling and dangerous. So my amendment ensures that the federal air marshals are effectively using their funds to deploy personnel on inbound flights that are considered high risk by the Department of Homeland Security, that there's no limitation on that ability. They are one of our first lines of defense. Uh, and in defending the cockpit and aircraft cabin against terrorist attacks. Uh, as a ranking member on the Transportation Subcommittee, I've worked over the years uh, and sponsored legislation to see that we have enough air marshals that they will receive all the requisite training to effectively secure aircraft. Make no mistake, the, the threat to our aviation system from aircraft inbound to the United States from foreign airports is serious and dangerous, just as it is in our rail system. And on Christmas Day 2009, we saw the underwear bomber uh, try to ignite PETN and destroy a plane over Detroit. We need air marshals. 
And as I indicated, the demise of Osama bin Laden has caused many to rise up and to begin to think, what is their next effort and attack, if you will, on the issue of uh, aviation security? So while my amendment deals with the threat on inbound aircraft to the U.S., its ultimate impact will be to ensure that air marshals are assigned to the highest risk. I also intend to move forward on my FAMS legislation that will provide training and increased um, productivity, but also personnel. But this clearly goes to the heart of the problem. Protect the American public. Protect them as they travel domestically. Protect them as they travel internationally. And if you ever for a moment doubt the potential of havoc, then you just need to look on that Christmas Day, that unexpected act of a so-called underwear bomber, or, if you will, the shoe bomber of some years past. And then if you want to bring it closer to home, you go back three or four weeks ago and see the series of incidences that required passengers and flight attendants to be engaged. And so I ask my colleagues to support uh, this amendment. Uh, it is in the form of a limitation that no funds should be uh, used to limit uh, the enhanced utilization, which will require creative thinking uh, and the ability to use resources effectively. My bill actually says, which this is not my bill, we should have two FAMs uh, inbound, uh, two undesignated, unnoted individuals that can provide a cover and a buffer from what has to be a very bad climate. Let me thank uh, the Federal Air Marshals as well for their service. Let me thank those under Homeland Security for their service, including my friends at the Transportation Security Administration. They are in a tough, tough neighborhood. I close by simply just saying there will be a amendment on the floor dealing with collective bargaining for TSOs. Again, in my capacity on that committee, let me say that collective bargaining has no impact on the great work of the TSOs, and we should the keep that in mind. I ask expired. my colleagues to support my amendment, what purpose and I yield back. The gentleman from Alabama rise. Mr. Chairman, uh, we are prepared to accept the gentlelady's amendment. What purpose does the gentleman from North Carolina rise? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last words. The gentleman is recognized. I want to, want to commend our colleague from uh, the authorizing committee, a leader of the authorizing committee, for focusing on uh, the deployment of air marshals to maximum effect and want to offer a support for her amendment. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the gentleman from Missouri rise. Mr. Chair, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chair, I rise in support of striking language that would limit UASI funds to the top ten cities at risk. Since 2003, my district, Missouri 5, has received over $70 million. Strike the record for the number of words. I, I, I will yield. And, and make a, your statement. I, I yield. Thank you. The gentleman would, withdraws his amendment. Is there further debate on the gentle aid from Texas amendment? If not, the chair will put the question. All those in, all those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. Uh, the ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. Thank you. What purpose does the gentleman from Missouri rise now? Mr. Chairman, again, I uh, ask to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as I uh, had uh, begun to, to say, um, I support striking language that would limit UIC funds to the top ten cities at risk. Uh, since 2003, uh, Missouri 5, my district, has received over $70 million in UIC funding recently. I was informed by DHS that due to the fiscal year 11 budget cuts that I did not support, half of the cities that received UIC funding, including Kansas City, Missouri, would lose their funding. This means that Kansas City will not be receiving funding that we've relied on for the last seven years. Limiting FY12 UIC funding to the top 10 cities would again detrimentally harm my district. UIC funding in Kansas City has been used for equipment and vehicles to support six rescue teams and four area fire departments. Vehicles and equipment have been also used to support special tactical law enforcement teams allowing response to events where chemicals or special hazards 
are present, as well as a regional multi-band emergency radio that allows for inter interoperability. Funding has been used for a regional patient tracking system that enables hospitals and EMS agencies to manage multiple victims from an emergency event. The funding also allows for special mobile units that allow local public health agency to agencies to transport equipment and set up medical dispensing sites. Yesterday, the Kansas City Star ran an op-ed I wrote decrying the devastating impact the loss of UASI funds will have not only on Kansas City, but the entire state of Missouri. Kansas City has relied on these funds to prevent, protest, and respond to both man-made and natural disasters. Eliminating these, fundings, these funds would greatly hinder the region's ability to continue to enhance these preparedness capabilities. Just two weeks ago, three UIC-funded search and rescue vehicles were sent from my community, Kansas City, Missouri, to Joplin, Missouri, to search for survivors after the devastating tornado. Sadly, to date, as of this morning, 134 Missourians have lost their lives to this devastating disaster. However, due to the hard work of Missouri first responders, 144 missing individuals were located. We put the safety and security of our constituents in the hands of first responders, and it would be unconscionable for us to take away the tools they need to continue to save lives. As the representative of the Missouri 5th District, it is my job to work to protect the citizens of my district and it is my goal to ensure that first responders in Kansas City are given the resources they need to keep our homes secure. As I've said many times, the U.S. budget is a moral document, a bold testimony to our national priorities. It is my priority to fight to provide UIC funding to the Kansas City area. This is why I stand in support of UIC funds and the amendment to restore this funding to more than the top ten cities that has been offered by Mr. Higgins of New York. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Gentlemen's time has expired. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, proceedings will now resume on those amendments on which further proceedings were postponed in the following order. An amendment by Mr. Clark of Michigan, an amendment by Mr. Sessions of Texas, an amendment by Ms. Loomis of Wyoming, an amendment by Mr. Carter of Texas, an amendment by Mr. Price of North Carolina, an amendment by Mr. Sherman of California, an amendment by Mr. Gozar of Arizona. The chair will reduce to two minutes the time for any electronic vote after the first vote in this series. The unfinished business is the request for a recorded vote on an amendment offered by the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Clark, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the no's prevail by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Clark of Michigan. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for recorded vote will rise and be counted. A sufficient number having arisen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device this will be a 15-minute vote. A series of amendments votes here on the House floor for the fiscal year 2012 Homeland Security Spending Bill. This amendment by Representative uh, Clark of Michigan would strike a provision in the FEMA section of the bill that, li that limits what's called the Urban Area Security Initiative. A 15-minute vote on the House floor, their first recorded vote of the afternoon, and a series of votes here probably up to six. We expect up to six amendment votes.
The House today will finish up work on the Homeland Security spending bill for fiscal year 2012. $42 billion, 3% less than this year and 6% less than requested by President Obama. A series of seven votes, seven amendment votes on the floor. This one's 15 minutes and the following six five-minute votes after that. This one by uh, Congress, Congress, uh, Congressman Clark of um, Michigan would strike a provision in the FEMA section limiting what's called the Urban Area Security Initiative. One of the amendments getting votes this afternoon. The House will likely finish up work on the Homeland Security bill and then uh, move on to s begin some work on the uh, 2012 spending bill for veterans, military construction and veterans affairs. Also today, in fact, at this hour in New Hampshire, Mitt Romney is announcing his run for the presidency. You can follow that live online at cspan.org. It's also over on C-SPAN 3. A couple of meetings to tell you about House, um, House Democrats will be meeting with President Obama mid-afternoon today, and meanwhile, all of the House freshmen will be le meeting later this afternoon with Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner, who's on Capitol Hill to talk about the raising of the debt limit. We'll have cameras there later this afternoon in case there are comments after that meeting.
The House has been considering the fiscal year 2012 bill for the Homeland Security Department. A series of seven amendment votes on the floor now. This one's a 15-minute vote, and the six after that will be uh, two-minute votes. One of those amendments will be one introduced late Wednesday by Brad Sherman of California that would prevent any uh, Homeland Security funds from being used to violate the War Powers Act. The Hill writes about this, that in doing so, he forced a recorded vote today on his amendment, which will require members indirectly to address the growing controversy about U.S. military action in Libya. They say that Sherman had harsh words for President Obama, who he said is violating the War Powers Act by keeping U.S. troops in Libya beyond a 60-day window after which congressional authorization is needed. So a vote on that amendment is coming up in this series on the House floor. Meanwhile, John Stanton of Roll Call writes that House Majority Leader Eric Cantor said today it appears increasingly likely that Republicans will join anti-war Democrats Friday in demanding an end to U.S. involvement in the civil war in Libya. The House is expected to take up the resolution by Dennis Kucinich, calling for an end to the U.S. operations in the NATO-led campaign in Libya. Uh, John Stanton writes that House Republicans are set to meet today, this afternoon, to discuss Libya and whether they should back Kucinich, Cantor said. GOP support is clearly driven by the lack of a clear mission and, quote, the seeming disregard of the role that Congress plays under the Constitution. That's from Eric Cantor. So that could be a, a second incarnation of um, Congress, the House anyway, speaking about Libya. The first will be this amendment by Brad Sherman, which comes up in this series. It'll be the second to last vote here. And again, this is the first of seven votes, 15-minute vote on the House floor, and then the following six will be two-minute votes.
Well, the House's goal is to uh, finish work today on the fiscal year 2012 Homeland Security Spending Bill. And toward that end, a series of votes here, seven amendment votes. This first one by Representative Clark of Michigan would strike a provision in the uh, FEMA section of the DHS bill that would limit the Urban Area Security Initiative. It's a 15-minute vote on the, on the House floor, and the following six votes will be two-minute votes. One of those will be an amendment by Brad Sherman of California that would prohibit the use of DHS funds for um, for the um, for a mission in in Libya, and along those lines, we may see more action on that tomorrow in terms of a uh, resolution on Libya. The Hill's Russell Berman writes that uh, House Republican is gathering fast support for a resolution that es expresses disapproval of the U.S. military intervention in Libya, raising the possibility of a rare congressional rebuke of President Obama on foreign policy. They say that Michael Turner of Ohio introduced today a one-page bill that says the House, quote, does not approve United States intervention in Libya. Russell Berman of the Hill writing that Turner, a member of the House Armed Services Committee, has already garnered 63 co-sponsors. He told the Hill making the legislation a possible alternative to a measure offered by anti-war Representative Dennis Kucinich that would mandate an immediate withdrawal of U.S. forces. So any like action on those two uh, resolutions uh, would happen at the very least uh, tomorrow. What we're going to see in a few minutes is the Representative uh, Sherman of California and his amendment that would prohibit the use of funds from this in this uh, Homeland Security bill from being used is, as they say, in the amendment in contravention of the War Powers Resolution. That'll be the second to last amendment vote coming up here in just a few minutes.
Obviously going a bit beyond the 15 minutes allotted for this amendment vote, an amendment by Hanson Clark, Democrat of Michigan, which would strike a provision in the Homeland Security Bill in the FEMA section that would limit the Urban Area Security Initiative, the grants to the top 10 at-risk cities. This is the first of seven amendments that will get votes. The following six amendments here will get uh, two-minute votes. A little bit of vote changing going on in this 15-minute uh, vote on an amendment to the Homeland Security Spending Bill for fiscal year uh, 2012. This is a 15-minute vote, and that's obviously been extended beyond that. This amendment by um, Congressman Clark of, of Michigan. On this vote, the yeas are 273, the noes are 150. The amendment is agreed to. The unfinished business is a request for recorded vote on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Sessions, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the ayes prevail by voice vote. Clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Sessions of Texas. Recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request will rise.